Good evening. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, I would like to welcome you to the Central Library for our annual Lowell Lecture Series. We're delighted you could join us this evening for the opening, presenting David McCauley. I'm David McKay, for those who don't know, the head of the Boston Public Library Foundation. Fran Kelly, one of our foundation board members, along with his team at Arnold Worldwide, created the video you just saw a few minutes ago to help share the story of what the Boston Public Library means to the people of Boston and to the Commonwealth. It is a particularly kind thing of him to do pro bono for us as well. Uh, through its work, the BPL Foundation provides funding for programs for all ages, from the children to seniors, exhibitions, lectures like the ones tonight, capital improvements and acquisitions for the entire library system, all in the name of advancing learning, the library's mission. If you're interested in knowing a little bit more about the foundation, you can see us on our website at www.pplf.com. Before I introduce David McCauley, I have a few housekeeping details. And for those who are part of the Lowell Lectures family over the years, you will know this is the part where I tell you to turn off those things that make a lot of noise in the silence. So if you would, iPads, beepers, telephones, those kinds of things. Also, um, Mr. McCauley will speak for about 30 to 35 minutes. It will be followed with a question and answer period. And then out in the hallway, we have uh, books available, and he will uh, sign for you. We couldn't do this uh, without the help of the Lowell Institute, and we are grateful to them for their continued support of this series. And uh, they have been doing this uh, since the inception of the Lowell Institute, since 1836, and they continue to this very day. And their specific mission is of making great ideas accessible to all people free of charge, fitting perfectly with our motto that's emblazoned on our front door, free to all. The 2012-2013 Lowell Lecture Series, Common Ground, celebrates public spaces and their creators, chroniclers, and communities of users. This is part of a larger initiative at the library, Building Boston. The lectures supplement an expansive schedule of programs which will take place throughout the city of Boston in the library locations and five impressive exhibitions presented here at the Central Library. And they are, starting with one already open, The Palaces for the People, Guastafino and America's Great Public Spaces, The People's Own, Construction of the McKim Building, An Elevated View, The Orange Line, and two exhibitions opening to the public on the 17th of November, Boston Sports Temples, which will be in the lobby just upstairs, and the Boston and the Gilded Age mapping public places in the Norman B. Leventhal Map Center. On our next lecture, we will have uh, joining us Robert Candle Campbell and Peter Vanderwarker, the Boston Globe's art critic and photographer, respectively, who also happen to be the co-authors of Cityscapes of Boston. David McCauley received his bachelor's degree from the Rhode Island School of Design, and in 1973, he traveled to France to work on his first of 25 books, Cathedral. He then constructed a colonial Roman town in his book City, published in 1974, erected monuments to the pharaohs, dissected the maze of subterranean systems below and essential to every major city in his book Underground, published in 1976. He built a medieval fortress in Castle and surprisingly dismantled the Empire State Building in his book Unbuilding, published in 1980. Macaulay is probably best known for what is described in his bio as a very thick book, but I don't think of it as too thick, The Way Things Work. Co-authored by Neil Ardley, this exhaustively researched compendium presents the hows and whys of much of the technology we take for granted. Building Big, the companion book to a five-part PBS television series about major, en uh, excuse me, major engineering features around the world was published in 2000. In response to the events of September the 11th, Mosque was published in 2003, and 2003 also marked the beginning of his work on his book on the human body, The Way We Work. 
For his most recent book, Built to Last, Macaulay slipped into reverse and re-illustrated both cathedral and castle, only this time in color. In 2009, David Macaulay's studio, an imprint of roaring book publishers, was founded to produce books that explain things. So far, says Mr. Macaulay, nothing has been produced for which there is no explanation. In 2000, the associates of the Boston Public Library honored Mr. Macaulay as a literary light at their annual Spring Awards dinner. In 2006, Mr. Macaulay was named as the MacArthur Fellow of one of, one of two that will be part of this series this year. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming David Macaulay to the library. Hi there, thank you. Thanks for coming. Where else would you go? <laughs> um, I'm going to try something a little bit, uh, a little bit odd tonight. Uh, I'm going to be, be going between slides and some drawing. Now I've either done drawing or I've done slides. So this could be totally confusing and pointless, but we, we'll see how it goes. I, I, I'd like to start... This is a lecture series about, I mean, uh, focusing around public spaces and, and, you know, sort of the cornerstones of um, civic, social life, and so on and so forth. Those, those sort of things that we take for granted that we assume will always be there. And, and um, I, I started thinking about this uh, a while ago, not far enough back, actually. But um, I realized I've been working with public spaces since I started doing books, and actually even before. Um, the first time I began to really think about a space was um, a, sp a town square in Italy, in a little town called Pienza, which you may or may not know, but it looks a little like this. I've got a crib sheet, because I can't remember the numbers of arches and things of that nature, but basically you have a, a this is from the air, piazza, you have a palace, you have a courtyard in the palace, you have a church, you have another palace. This is the palace for the bishops. And down here you have a building for the commune with a tower. And then you have a little building over here. And you have a well right there. Okay, so aerial view, trapezoidal. So when you walk into this, you sort of the, the space opens up. It's a very small space. I think this is about 85 feet, and this is about 75 feet, and um, something like that. Um, the uh, the palace was built by Piccolomini, Ennio Piccolomini, who became Pius II, which is when the name of the original vill village, which I've forgotten, was changed to Pienza, which means pious, apparently in Italian, I guess. Um, and, you know, local boy makes good. Becomes Pope. Goes right back to his village of like 37 people. Says, we need a big palace. We're going to need this, this sort of ideal town square. This is around 1460. And, you know, people were just beginning to think about uh, what was essential to create, these, to create the, the urban community. And it sort of needed the church and the palace and the place that the, you know, the sort of communal center for the, for the people of the community. And in this case, on this side, one more building for the, um, the bishops who would have to come to Pienza from time to time. I bet they loved that trip um, to be with the Pope, to help him out, to do Pope stuff. So, um, so anyway, that's sort of what the square looks like, but it doesn't really give you much of a, much of a feel. So I thought what I would, try to do is just give you a little bit of a little bit more of a sense of it and let's see how far I can get without looking at my cheat sheet that's not very far I know but um, here we go and okay so I'll just give you a little you know it's, this is what I do and this is really what I'm going to be talking about tonight. you know what I do but um, I I really spend a lot of time trying to capture what makes spaces work. 
and at the same time explain how things get to be where they are and what they are, how they are made. Um, and then we have a little thing in here, we have a little thing in here, and we need a little window up here, we need this, okay. So, very crude, but how about a nice big window there, because we can do it with this, this building. Okay, so that's very simple. Now, we need to sort of get, the, get some steps in there. We have to have a little platform on which, and then sort of here, we're going to have to build this palace. And here we're going to have to put the, the well, because this is obviously an important item for the town. You know, it's like meeting at the water cooler for conversation. Um, this is just on a slightly grander scale, but this whole thing is so ungrand in a way. That it's one of the things that makes it so terrific. Um, and we've got columns, and we've got two columns here, I believe, and then we've got two more here, and then more there, and so on. Um, we can bring these all the way up to the top, and we can bring in our windows. We'll have to build an arch over them, because otherwise the, the, heavy, the weight of the, the stone will collapse on the windows. We don't want that. So build another relieving arch, and another relieving arch, and another relieving arch, and another relieving arch. What's wonderful about these squares, one of the things is just the way these repeated forms happen in all of the building. You can see it in the church. You can see it here. There's a kind of unity to, this, to these walls of buildings of completely different function. And it's one of the things that I particularly like about Italian spaces and Italian squares. So, and it probably goes back one more. And then, of course, there's a very large um, cornice and overhang and so on and so forth. Then we go down a little windy street. And on this side, we build the smaller palace, which, if I remember correctly, is actually only about two stories. Maybe, no, it's three. Um, but it's compared to the, the Piccolomini Palace. You see, the bishops are just visiting, so they don't get the full treatment. <laughs> anyway, so you get that. And there's a little door in the center and some little windows and so on and so forth. And then another little building back there. And there's a tower back there. And so, and then the trapezoid. And the road comes like this and like this, but it bends. So when you're looking down this road, um, you're basically, when you actually, when you come from here, let's say this is you, this is your camera case and your <laughs> luggage and stuff like that. Perhaps you're being harassed by a local dog. Um, so over here, you know, you, you sort of come down the street and you see the, the sort of the communal building, you see the edge of it, first of all, and actually it's sort of three more arches, kind of like this. And then this is the second floor, and this is the big um, sort of uh, the town hall, where this is where they, they have their council meetings and three more windows up there to reflect the arches below. But um, you can't see what's happening. I mean, th this, is, this palace right here become, is sort of this palace, the bishop's palace, the little guy. And then it just disappears. And another thing that's so wonderful about these, um, I'll just put a little shadow in there to give you a sense of where we're going. Um, th there's always a mystery. There's always, you are being lured into these spaces. And part of the, the joy of, for, for me at least, of spending time in Rome, and I've spent a lot of time there. I started spending time there as a student. I spent a year there. Um, and it was one of those life-changing um, experiences. So I'm going to take you on a little travelogue. Um, so let's go to slides, Joe, and then we'll come back and I'll show you something else here. Um, I don't do the, 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 you know, the, the scene with the brook and the trees and the things with the paintbrush. Unfortunately, I just can't do that, or I would, because I like working with this equipment. But let's go to slides and um, take a look at a couple of pictures. Okay, so we're going to Rome, and it's all there. Um, the, the pictures are not, these are not the greatest pictures. One of the reasons is that they're not so terrific is that I, I had prints made in the local camera shop near where we were staying in Rome, and I wanted them almost immediately, so they, I think they never changed the chemicals. Um, I haven't looked at the negatives, but the prints are just really awful, and I had to actually scan them, but love this door. 
I mean, these places have, they make an, you know, make an entrance. Let's have a real door. Actually, the real door, you can see at the bottom, with that little hole in it. That's the door that people would use most of the time. But it's astonishing to see the sizes of some of these. It must have been huge horses or huge carriages or something like that because there's really no other explanation or maybe, you know, um, lances or something like that. Here's a more modest door with some plants. Um, Walking past buildings, I mean, these, the, the, the journeys down the streets of Rome, I think, is just one of the most pleasurable experiences that life has to offer. Um, the mixture of old and new, the high tech, the low tech, the, the, uh, the luring into, I mean, how can you not pass this courtyard and want to know what the courtyard looks like or want to know what the garden beyond the courtyard looks like? I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a tease and a treat and, and so on. Um, sometimes you get inside a courtyard, this is the courtyard of the Cancelleria, and the columns that you can see on that second level are quite similar to the columns in the courtyard here in the library. They're supposedly modeled on some aspects of the Cancelleria, which is attributed to Raphael, I believe. Um, the streets that sort of, you can't tell exactly where they lead, um, Occasionally, a church breaks things up for a while, and you've got statues and, and um, other things to look at. You've got wonderful scroll buttresses like this, just very playful. It's amazing what you can do with stucco. Wait till you see what you can do with Guastavino tile. But stucco is not bad. Um, here's another little street that sort of just dead ends into a church. You know you're going to be able to turn left or right. But there's a real sense of destination, and you could begin to see how lines sort of, they're not exactly, nobody said, we need to make the cornice at the second level of the church exactly 23 feet or whatever measurement they were using, um, so that it lines up with the second level or third level of the houses that line the street. It's just that these lines have a tendency, we, we adjust uh, or compensate, I guess I should say, for the, for the differences. And we end up with a sort of unified space with such tremendous variety, which is, again, I think one of the most, impe- most appealing things about these. Now, occasionally you head down a street where you will swear there is no way out. And it doesn't get any better when you look up. So, I mean, this is an amazing, this is like the formwork for the Flatiron Building. They just pulled the Flatiron Building back and they left this. But anyway... Um, here's another typical street where um, that sort of the vitality, the life that is brought to these really hard streets. These are, you know, they can be really noisy and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and those of you who have been know exactly what I mean. But, you know, bringing out um, some, some umbrellas and some, some awnings, put, setting up some tables and chairs, maybe just putting a simple little hedge in a metal box. Um, and suddenly you're just far enough away from the action, like about eight inches um, from vehicles passing you, but it's enough to feel, um, it's enough to create the illusion of safety long enough to have coffee and something like that. But, but it works and it sort of softens up this street and makes what would otherwise be a very hard canyon into, into something that, you know, is sort of fun to be in. Um, if you've got a little bit more space, you can actually put that sort of little structure in the middle of the space, in the middle of the piazza, um, or in a little opening, a little wide area. So um, if you happen to need water for either washing your car or you know, giving a, your dog a drink and things of that nature, you might use an old sarcophagus. That's what I mean by the old and the new, this fantastic mixture of... Um, of, of bits and pieces from centuries, the uh, water fountains that run all the time, and the uh, you know those in the know who you know put their finger over the water fountain so that the water springs through the hole in top of the little uh, faucet so you can drink it. Um, here's a fragment of a column that somebody found or um, just decided it would save some material. Here's um, the remains of a, of a sort of portico. Um, and, and another column, uh, and things get filled in. Sometimes things get filled in because they were, um, they became sort of hiding places for unscrupulous individuals, and so the town fathers would have said, "Okay, let's time to wipe out those dark colonnades and, and um, make the streets a little safer." Um, what, what you know, what an image like this reminds me of is this wonderful. Um, chance encounter we sometimes will have in Rome with the original sort of structure of the building 
once the stucco has fallen off it or been taken off it. Often, um, when new stucco is going up, they will, you know, chip it all off and so on and so forth and expose the scar tissue of these buildings that have been changed but not replaced. Changed, transformed over the centuries to meet different needs. Of, uh, and those needs could be, could be quite different, but I'm really talking about things like changing window sizes and numbers of windows and, um, it would really depend on the political, uh, you know, sort of stability of the time, on the wealth of the people moving into those buildings, of whether or not the building was to be a kind of a, an apartment building or uh, because, of the, you know, the sort of palazzo um, that, it, that it began as no longer had a family that could support it and so on and so forth. But it, it requires these changes and you can see the way things are stitched and patched and cut and so on. And then it all gets covered with a new coat of stucco and you can wander down the streets in Rome at certain times and it feels like it was finished yesterday. Here's a last little bit of stucco. Um, but you can see the rough, the rough stuff under it, the brick and, and stuff are ready to take a new coat. I'm not sure what's going to happen with that little patch or whether that was just left there for a starting point. I don't really know. Um, the Campo de Fiori is one of my favorite piazzas in Rome, and it's the market um, square, at least until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And this is a drawing I made for, a, um, it's one of the only finished drawings I'll show you. There are only about half a dozen. Um, but you can see all the sort of canvas tents and so on and so forth in rows. The market proper is in the foreground and in the background it's a flower market. And just beyond that, at the foot of the building, as usual, is the uh, other restaurants like the Cabernara and so on. Um, the view from the restaurant looking down one of the alleys. Again, the, you know, this jumble of buildings and this space that happens to have been, for the most part, created sort of by accident. Um, but at some point it's recognized as a working space and that may have happened 600 years ago. Um, you got a musician, you got to have a musician, um, preferably a saxophone. This guy was actually really good. And um, the photographs, not all of them, but most of these photographs were taken by my kids who are now 15 and 13, the youngest ones. And um, when we travel, we give them the cameras. So you will often see things at a somewhat lower level than you used to. But that would explain why. I mean, Sander must have been under the table for this one. It's hard to tell exactly where he was. It wouldn't surprise me. So if you see something that seems a little lower, it's one of the kids. Um, here's the flower market. When they're, and you can see the flower market is actually around the fountain. Now, the flower will eventually go. Those, those carts and things will eventually be dragged down the side streets and stored in garages until the next morning when they're brought back and set up again and so on. But the way this thing uh, sort of is transformed over the course of the day, this piazza is really uh, wonderful. Um, it's cleanup time. Now the market, as you can see, is gone. There's a lot of stuff. Rome actually has better color than this. I think I should remind you of that. This is unusual. This is unusual color. Um, this is like black and white slides with a little tinting. So let's just say these were. These are all photographs from 1870, and. And this is an 1863 garbage truck that's actually, you know, so it's completely spotless by 2, 2.30 in the afternoon. From the Campo de Fiori, look down the street, and there's that sort of wonderful vista. You look down the street, and you can see there's something there, and something quite large, something quite spectacular. If you wander down another street, you'll end up um, seeing the same thing, but from a different angle. This is Piazza, uh, Palazzo Farnese. And um, with its two fountains, one on each side of the square, again, the square is not square. It's a, it's a square as Copley Square. Um, not so square. Um, but, it, but it works. The level, again, the, the way we tend to read the sort of uh, the lines of the coursework, the, um, the accent lines in the buildings and where we tend to link them. And there's this feeling of harmony to these spaces, which is, which is ironic because the buildings are all different and all slightly, um, you know, slightly different dimensions and so on. Um, that's the French embassy, just in case you should ever need um, asylum in Rome. And it's the closest embassy, and you think you can get in, plus good food. Now, if you head down this little street on the right-hand side, you will come to this arch. Now, this arch was built to connect the back of the Palazzo Farnese to the Farnese Chapel, and it was intended that these arches would continue all the way across the Tiber, which is just a little further to our right, 
And if you go there at a different time of year, the arch is completely covered with vines. So it turns into a completely, I mean, a theatrical setting. And look at that sort of Palladio um, theater view, except those are real buildings. They're not actually only three feet tall at the bottom, um, you know, sort of at the very end, and it's only six feet deep. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, they love to play with that, but it was very, it's very easy when you see something. In reality, this is Via Giulia, um, and if you go right down to the end of it and take a left, you're uh, basically at the bridge that will bring you to the road that leads you up to St. Peter's, and everything's all neatly connected, but not in the way that would seem most, um, most uh, immediately recognizable. Wonderful street surfaces, hard, yes, incredibly durable. Need to fix that pipe? Just pull up the stones, um, put them in a pile by the side of the road, dig up the sand, fix the pipe, put the sand back, pack it down, and get all those stones to fit together again. Now, I could barely draw these stones in this pattern, but they actually physically do it. They get these, these scalloping shapes. Um, I mean, it's spectacular, beautiful. And when they're wet, they really are wonderful. Um, Piazza del Popolo, one of the most sort of large, spectacular piazzas. Um, you know, when piazzas get really, really big, they tend to fall apart a little bit. This one, not so much because of, because of these two churches, uh, um, built to create this fantastic sort of secondary gateway. The main gateway into the city is right behind us, um, as is the obelisk that marks the center of this space and gives it some sort of identity. And when you think about sticking an obelisk or a tree in the middle of a space, um, you know, it's not a wall, it's not permanent, but if you line them up a certain way, you can create the illusion of a wall, you can create the illusion of a barrier, and just creating the illusion of a barrier within a larger space changes the scale of the space, or the way we think of the scale of the space, and creates a level of comfort that you might not feel in a really large space. It doesn't take much. Um, oh, so head down the street to the left, and you will end up um, at the Spanish Steps, looking down from the top of the Spanish Steps, blah, blah, blah. If you take the middle road, you will end up at the Monument of Victor Emmanuel, which is larger than absolutely everything else. Um, this is sort of the side view of Victor Emmanuel's monument. That stairway, this is how the kids saw it. And you can, this, is, this reminds me of trying to climb, um, or not trying to, but of climbing the Great Pyramid, uh, where you just look up and the steps just, relentless. Um, but anyway, and there's the church of the uh, Araceli. And if you do make it all the way up there and go inside, you get this fantastic um, display of chandeliers. It looks like a chandelier shop, actually, is what it looks like. <laughs> and, of course, next to it is the Campidoglio and this brilliant sort of pattern of, of uh, marble set in the stone. Um, to sort of tie all the, the sides together. This is another trapezoidal piazza. And, um, and you can go into this, one of the two side buildings, into the courtyard, pick a little bit of that stonework up just to sort of link the outside to the inside and um, admire some of the pieces of sculpture. Um, not far, we're going to find Piazza Navona, one of the most famous, um, obviously, squares, piazzas in Rome the site of the old uh, stadium for racing, not chariot races like Colosseum, smaller than that, but running and so on. Um, and here's the fountain being, uh, being cleaned. These, these three fountains, one at each side, one in the center, that kind of define, um, help define this whole space, but also break it into smaller sections. So within the space between each of the fountains, you have a feeling of being in a space that's still kind of human scaled, even though the whole thing is quite long. There's the view from one end of it, from inside the courtyard of a, one of the buildings. The great thing about going to Rome for me is it starts making me look at everything with a certain um, care that I forget. And I think this is why we take the kids. Um, it has heightened your visual sensitivity to everything, including this piece of pastry. I mean, watching the sugar um, drop down through, the, uh, through the, the foam on top of your coffee, it takes quite a while, sometimes, you know, three minutes, and gradually the foam consumes it, and there's this little gratifying bloop as it disappears. I mean, those are the things you start to notice in a place that heightens your senses 
um, the way Rome does. Trevi, uh, tortoise, tur tortoise fountain, or turtle fountain. Now, okay, we have to back up. When I went back to Rome after my year of school, so this was in the summer of 1973, I was to work on city, I made these sketches. So these are ancient sketches, so the appropriate discoloration um, helps them. But you can see, this is how I was drawing. I was simply recording and trying to do it simply. And, you know, you get a lot of detail. Then we, I went down to Herculaneum and Pompeii and measured stuff, um, like this water fountain, you can see. Um, I spent a lot of time measuring things and just sort of looking for details and um, you know, trying to record as much of it so that I could eventually make drawings like this one, which is a sort of half-colored version of one of the drawings that was originally in city. But again, the sort of meeting at the water cooler um, in these towns. I mean, the water fountain was obviously very important. It's where you got your water unless you were one of the super wealthy. Um, but then when I went back years later, like 20 years later, I drew in a different way. Um, sometimes I wonder if I didn't draw as well or as carefully, but I drew with more, more spontaneity, a little more vitality not worrying about making a finished drawing always. Sometimes, yes, but sometimes just looking for little, like the white stripes around the legs of the guys who sweep the streets, that reflective tape. So when they stand together, again, it creates that sort of, that white line that seems continuous and seems to sort of create a certain harmony, even among the guys in their sort of dark blue-green outfits um, who are sweeping streets. A lot of little maps and journeys started to creep in, looking down the end of the street on the right-hand side, and with the stucco work on the corner of a building that starts to create a frame through which you see the building beyond it, which is literally just across the street, maybe another 10 or 12 feet. And I, I thought maybe I should do a little guidebook about Rome um, that you could sort of follow with a little map and some details and then some aspects of the view, um, the stucco on the brick and so on, um, and then you turn the page and you'd, if you followed the street, you'd be looking at the Palazzo Farnese, which you just did. And if you kept walking, you, you would, there would be a bridge over your head connecting these two, um, two buildings on either side of you. Um, so, I, I mean, I played with this idea for a while and uh, I never did it because it just seemed stupid. So um, it didn't say anything about Rome that I wanted to say, but I loved getting the information. I loved sort of getting it all um, collected in this one little book. Then I made these drawings, and these kind of look like stage set drawings. I expect somebody, um, soprano, to come around the corner screaming her head off um, with, when I see an image like this. There's no people. It's totally static. But again, the richness of, of surface detail, the way the stucco is cut, the archworks over the doors, the kinds of things that make you... Um, that get you drawn, that draw you into a space that make you sort of begin to sort of see connections between things that nobody has to point out. You just begin to notice them. The Campidoglio, here's another. Um, I wanted to do something a little more three-dimensional eventually. I sort of wanted to play a little bit more. Now, this is the road that leads to the church of Santa Maria della Pace. And it's a little white thing at the bottom of the... Um, Street. And as you get closer, you begin to see more and more of this church. And if this piece of um, building on the right-hand side is on a fold-out, it folds out, what you end up with when you fold it out is the entire, uh, the entire facade. And then you could continue on past the little portico, um, down along the right-hand side into the alley, which is here and which I tried to sketch um, at one time, I think probably after lunch, and um, eventually managed to turn into a single drawing. Uh, I was actually looking at some of the details of the stonework in this very dark alley. This was before it was cleaned for the millennium, and everything now looks white and so on and so forth. It actually looks pretty terrific, but it was black then. Anyway, I was trying to figure out, okay, where does this material start and this material end and so on and so forth. Um, and it started raining. You can see the splatter work on top. The only other time it rained um, was when I was in Brazil making a drawing of the building of this, um, this, this dam under construction. And, um, but I don't want to distract you. So here's the, um, here's the alley again. 
and we, we come out from the alley. You can see the little map on the left-hand side that sort of places, it, places you, sort of a sense of where you are. So you could use this as a little guide. I still haven't gotten away from that completely, obviously. Um, you know, not far. We're going to find the Pantheon, and we're going to find that uh, obelisk and, and whatnot in the center of it. Now, um, let me show you. I didn't like the fold-out pages because, well, I did, but um, it seemed like an unnecessary expense to go to. So I thought, can you capture some sense of three-dimensional space in a conventionally printed book? So I brought the sketchbook in which these images are to be found. So let's go back to this. And there's the Pantheon. And then if I slide the book, there it is. Okay, now, if you don't open the book the whole way, you see what happens? Now, nobody said you have to open a book the whole way. It's not written in the book anywhere. You can't copy, you can't copy it, but you, you can hold it at 93 degrees or something like that. But you can see how... Um, so then you can go inside. I mean... It doesn't take much, you know, it's just basically, it's a flat book. And then, if I want to go to the extra effort, I can use the, the fold out as well and take you up there. So, and, you know, paper's flexible, you can bend it if you want. So, I mean, and I'm thinking, okay, Macaulay, here you are, doing this with paper and books and stuff. You could use an iPad and actually watch the Pantheon rotate, and so on and so forth, go above it, go down through the Oculus, and so on and so forth. Um, but you know what? You don't need any imagination to do that. I think, I think in a way, you are required to use imagination to appreciate more fully what's being sort of described in this totally flat stuff, where you're tricked into believing what is not possible. And all you need then is a book like this and this equipment and a large screen, and, um, and you're all set. Okay, let's go back to, I don't think there's anything else I want to, no, let's just go back to um, the slides so I don't lose myself completely. So anyway, there it is. This is how I was going to present it until I realized that we had this equipment. And uh, there it is, and so on and so forth. Now, I do like to draw things. This is a double-page drawing of the, um, of the Pantheon. So it does, but it, it, it's just, you know, to capture the space and show the light and so on and so forth, or to, you know, park a dirigible. Um, the, once, once you've been in a space like the Pantheon, it's an influence that doesn't, um, doesn't leave you. And whenever I have a chance to use it, like in this drawing from the way we work, um, the lung cavity uh, with, the bronch, with the bronchi coming in, and the uh, top of the diaphragm on the bottom, and this strong beam of light coming in from up here, so this pantheon like this. Pantheon lower left, Saint Ignacio on the right, which is a square that um, is basically framed by the way the buildings around it have been cut up. I mean, it's just remarkable. The saddest thing about the Piazza of Saint Ignacio is the fact that it's a parking lot. So you have to be careful to go out into the middle of the space and enjoy the view, because you really just want to stand like this and do that. Just do it either quickly or carefully. Um, slightly more lively drawings now of Rome. Um, Boulder, you know, playing with the sky again. I wanted to do a map of Rome that was just the sky, but as defined by all the streets and the, and the, the cornices of all the streets. And um, I just never, you know, I, I think if, you know, it's one of those ideas that when you think it the first time, you think, God, oh, that's brilliant. That'll be fantastic. And then you start to do like one or two things and you realize, this is really dumb. <laughs> anyway, scaffolding, playing with type and considering the, um, the fumes from a little scooter, zipping around the fountain in a typical larger square and really trying to weave the words and pictures together to capture not just the architecture of Rome, the sense of space, but the spirit 
and the playfulness and the element of surprise. And so there are countless sketches, some of which are more sort of academic, like this one on the right, where I'm literally just looking at the materials and saying what starts where. And then you look up and you see the, uh, the sky and uh, you start thinking about, you know, bits and pieces of things you've already... Like, for instance, the little drawing on the left, which is upside down, we'll turn it the other way so you can see it. Now you just take the buildings in the foreground and turn them into negative space, and you end up with this, just this sort of cut up version or, or, or uh, what's left of the church in the, in the background. And you start to focus um, on different things. Now if I b- you sort of would bleed out the church in the background and show you the details of the two buildings on either side, it would be a different kind of an image, and it would work, and it would, it would have a different effect. Sometimes the details of the entablatures and, and whatnot are just amazing to, uh, to try to figure out. Uh, out of it came you know, a series of pen and ink drawings. Um, sometimes you just need to go to Venice. You need a break. You need to get out of Rome. It's, it's big. It is noisy. Venice is quiet. Um, it's relaxing. San Marco is pretty fantastic. And the little squares one side of which is sort of defined very dramatically by the water. Um, but these are little squ- And these aren't like the squares of Rome. I mean, these are tiny little squares. And they're like a tree in the middle. That's it. Um, and, you know, I don't know how long it took me to get back from this square to wherever I started. But it was one of those, you know, how did I get here kinds of experiences. Finding different ways of looking at some of the materials. You've seen that before. Traveling over the city in different ways. Occasionally you have to you know, think about that. Now here's um, Palazzo, flat page, fold it, unfold it. This is, a, you know, again, thinking about how you might, to show the sort of the way they define the corners and the edges of these buildings in no uncertain terms. I mean, these buildings do, don't look like they're going anywhere. Not with that stonework, which of course is not really stonework. It's stucco work over much of the brick and or rubble um, wall behind it. And then you can open it up the whole way and see the courtyard inside. Um, and then, again, I've got pa- pages cut up throughout the book that are sort of folded and unfolded and so on. Um, sometimes it's just you want to have some fun. Um, Here's a, uh, just a double page spread, just using the flat pages of the book in the most simple way possible to kind of reinforce the, the simplicity of this interior courtyard. Um, there's a little bit of that courtyard, and here's the roof. Now I've moved over to put you on the rooftop. Now, this is actually a double gatefold, which means it has two pages that spread open. So if we spread them open, there's the chimney, um, and now you've got uh, domes and, and the, the, this you know, the sky and so on and so forth. Once you've got domes, I can take you to St. Peter's and show you a little bit about the construction in a very simplistic way of the, of the dome and the structure with this double skin. Now, if you don't have a lot of masonry and a lot of time, you might want to consider working in cast iron. So you'd start with something like these little brackets and then you'd run them around a circle of stone and um, you'd build this sort of balcony around it and you'd extend from the balcony the skin of cast iron, which you can see on the lower left. And you start building columns around it and a framework on top of that and you build it and you, um, you want coffers inside because you remember the Pantheon and that was kind of cool. Um, but you don't have uh, concrete. Um, you have cast iron so you make your coffers out of sheets of con- uh, cast iron. Now, two young urban planners, um, not yet seasoned, on the mall um, of our nation's capital with the, ca- with the capital dome behind which you just saw the construction of. Um, what a waste of space. What an, what an unimpressive, unimposing um, area that is, especially on a hot summer day. So what can you do with it? Well, this is a proposal I actually made quite a long time ago. But I, if you didn't see it, I, I was questioning, I suppose, seriously questioning the, um, the value uh, of having all those guys in those buildings um, day after day when they're not away. Uh, And I thought, let's get them farming. We have a lot of space and um, we could, you know, you got the House Ways and Means Committee out plowing the Southwest 40, that sort of stuff. It'd be terrific. And, um, you know, really feeling 
connected to the land and actually being useful. So um, now the Air and Space Museum, you can see on the left hand side with a few modifications. Um, I would turn that into a, um, an archive for the, uh, for the work of the 112th Congress. And we could, we could store both things they've done um, in that building. And it would require very little changing of signage or anything. Um, but then I thought, well, wait a minute. No, farming is... No, let's try something else. We, well, we could just like literally fill in the land and make lots of little streets and create a really interesting place. Um, but then maybe we could do something um, you know, even more meaningful to our representatives who come from all those different parts of the country. Each gets a little plot large enough to build something in the style of their home town, state, or whatever. And that's where they live. They live in these little places. They don't live in Georgetown. They actually live in their own little sort of... So it's sort of Disneyland, but for our elected representatives. And it uses them all. It creates a more interesting space. You'd have more surprises as a tourist. You still, when you start to move towards the Washington Monument, of course, you still have something, you know, that, that makes you feel really small. But, um, but here, you could actually sort of travel your own 50 states um, with your elected representative, and they, they would feel at home, you would feel at home. Um, we'd have to wrap the National Gallery with some, you know, like Hollywood set stuff, just because it's not going to fit in. But... Um, and Pennsylvania Avenue, which, as I understand it, is in pretty bad shape these days. Um, topiary <laughs> is always a winner. I mean, it looks fresh. And, um, you, you know, you just have to always have a new tree growing because there will always be another statue to make. Now, I end with a few pictures um, from Rome. This is... Uh, I know it looks like the dining room table and a dish of pasta with a fork in it and my son at the end of the table, but it's, it's more the, um, the, the piazza, uh, Navona, in scale, and that dish of pasta is the sort of fountain sitting in the center. So, and the chairs lined up along either side of it become the walls of the buildings that define the space. It's just depending on point of view. Um, these are Julia's pictures. That's Julia. Um, occasionally she's in one, which means she's not holding the camera. She's not that good. And when you see a picture like this, it's Alexander. So um, I, I think uh, that thing I said about the pastry, about really noticing little bits and pieces of things, the things that I walk past, it's so terrific having the cameras in their hands because um, and now you do see him and his dad. Uh, but, and this is Via Julia, so of course... Uh, but, that, you know, these are the things that attract their attention. Okay, yeah, there's a big, the Arch of Titus, that's nice. Arch of Constantine, that's nice. But that ice cream cone is fantastic. Um, maybe the narrow streets with the wonderful stucco work and so on, that's great. But that, t- that TV screen inside the little drugstore with all the security camera images on it at the same time, fantastic. So um, the cats in the Largo, Argentina, some of the graffiti on the wall. So remember what I said about creating the illusion of safety in space. Look at the way those lampposts kind of line up to define a, a surface that separates you from the traffic. But they don't, I mean, you stand between light posts, you can't even see them. But when you look that way down the street, you've got this hint of protection. It's an illusion, and you don't want to take it too seriously. Piazza Navona with Julia. My son jumping off a bollard in another piazza. And I am obviously thinking about whether or not I paid that last insurance bill (laughs) before we left. Dog in the market. I don't think the dog was for sale. Lunch around the edges of the market. Heaters. The kids were fascinated by the heaters. But the kinds of mixture. And finally, these, um, these things that make you look up. The column of Marcus Aurelius. The obelisk in front of something else not that far. But once you start being forced to look up, you look up a lot, and you look up at ceilings, and you look up at domes, and finally we look down to see where we've been, and there is Palazzo Farnese on the lower left, and there's the Piazza Farnese, there's the Campo, it must be afternoon because there are no um, you know, vendors set up, 
And there's the Cancelleria, the palace at the very top in the center. And that exterior wall is the influence for the courtyard of the old McKim building here. And there is Farnese again in the center and Piazza Farnese in front of it. And there is the Boston Public Library with the brickwork and so on and so forth. And this is a bit bigger, but there's just something about the space um, of the Piazza Farnese um, that is somewhat different from the space of Copley Square and the facade of the library. And a lot of it has to do with that enormous amount of space we've given over to traffic, to buses and cars and so on and so forth. So every block basically is an island that you take your life in your hands to get to, unless you're law-abiding, and then you simply let the lights tell you when to go. Um, and then you just have to watch out for cyclists. So anyway, there you, there you go. That's, that's my sort of quick, um, quick, quick tour of Rome now. Why take the kids to a place like Rome? Um, we've tried to do, we, we've managed to do it three times so far, take the kids to a, a city, a European city. I think... I mean, I, obviously, I, I love these places, and I want them to feel, in a sense, my passion. But I also, in a very selfish maneuver, I want to imbue these places with memories of family, just like they have memories of the residents of those spaces that have traveled through them for centuries. Well, we bring one more little collection of people, but as a family, um, I, and I say it's a little bit selfish because, you know, these the kids are... like. I'm 50 years older than these kids. So they're going to be around a lot longer than I am with any luck. And um, I want them to, when they do go back to these places, first of all, I want them to want to return to these places. But secondly, I want them to see in those walls and in those details and in those patterns of sky between the narrow canyon streets and so on, that blue against the the the, 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 the oranges and reds and... and um, you know, sort of yellowy colors of the stucco. I want them to think about our time there, our time as part of a much longer time, which I think is why these public spaces um, are so important. And, and, and we need to be better at thinking about the scale of the spaces we create. Occasionally we get it right. Um, the North End is, is an example of a place that seems to get those kinds of things right for very obvious reasons. There's nothing big there. There's nothing there, nothing standing there that makes us feel small. Everything makes us feel like part of some sort of um, organic fabric that will keep going after us that's been going quite a while before us. And I, I want that sense of continuity to be sort of absorbed by the kids um, because... Without that, it's really hard to be very optimistic about where we're going. Thank you. Now, yeah, sure. Not, I've spent some time in New Orleans. What was your reaction? Um, well, I like where, I've been. again, you can get on a street in New Orleans, you can get into parts of New Orleans and feel, it feels right. Um, I mean, like, it's like we do so often, we mix things up so much that um, that jumble of buildings, I have to jump again back to Boston because I was thinking about it this afternoon, that jumble of buildings behind Richardson's church behind Trinity Church. I mean, it's a jumble of buildings which turns the complexity of Richardson's architecture into more pieces, more bits and pieces. Um, it doesn't have that kind of backdrop it deserves, but that's the way we are. We just, we keep growing, we keep changing, and there's probably no way to stop it until we have to start dismantling these buildings because we can no longer afford to pay the heating bill um, or power. Uh, you know, I don't know New Orleans well enough to be able to really comment it. But around the church and that sort of area, um, there are examples, I mean, across the country, of things right. And uh, so it's not like Europe has, has all the good stuff. Um, 
It does have all the best stuff. And I think, though, it's because it has the oldest stuff. It has the stuff that, that reassures us that, you know, that in a way that people have come through, you know, awful things and seen the light on the other side and stuff is still there and it's still, they still care about it. I mean, remember a trip to uh, Prague in, I guess it was around 74, 73, 74, and um, it was so depressing. It was so dreary and, and so on. Because, you know, surprise, take somebody's freedom away and they actually don't care whether the paint is falling off their house. You know, it just doesn't seem to matter. Um, but give them their freedom back and the whole place is transformed. So, I mean, that's... The, anyway, that was a leap, I know. Yes? Uh, thank you so much. It was brilliant. Thank, thank you. Right. Does the use of arches perpetuate the kind of harmony I was talking about? I think it does. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, you, and the, the, the thing is, the arches keep changing scale. Sometimes it's a gateway to something. Sometimes it's, look, it's to look imposing. It's to celebrate something. Sometimes it is simply a way, as I said at the very beginning, of stopping the weight of the stone above a window from crushing it. So you need these relieving arches. But since they're still exposed to some extent, you end up with these rhythmic patterns. And of, of doing what? Hopscotching. Is that what you said? Hopscotching. That's a term I will use next time I give this talk. I also want to just tell you a quick thing about the law. My father actually served on the appropriations committee subcommittee for defense. And he thought it would be grand if we charged all the aircraft that the constituents around the country had paid for. That's right. Yes. That's right, their airplane. Oh, that's great. And that saves, you know, that's, and there's a nice harmony to that, too, which is terrific. Bomber after bomber. Yes. Yes. Uh, you have to forgive me, Ed. This is completely off topic from your amazing lecture today. Thank you. Why mammoths? Why mammoths? Um, why mammoths? With reference to the way things work, um, they crept into the book as I was sketching simple machines. And um, I, was, I, I realized that simple machines probably go way back. And um, I'm assuming cave people used, simple, used the lever and so on and so forth and discovered its properties. And at the same time, there would have been mammoths perhaps wandering around. And uh, it wasn't long before I realized that you could actually use a log and a rock to weigh a mammoth. As long as you had enough villagers brave enough and stupid enough to get on the other end of the log to achieve a horizontal. So that's how that happened. Yes. Hmm. That sounds kind of final. But, um, okay, among what's done so far. Right, okay. The most difficult book by far was The Way We Work, the human body book, because I knew nothing about the human body. I've had one for, you know, 60, almost 66 years now. Um, did I know where my pancreas was? Not a clue. Not a clue. I knew it wasn't far, but I couldn't have tell you, told you where it was or what it did. So, what, so that was a six, between six and eight years, that project. And it's the best thing and the worst thing about what, uh, the freedom I have. I pick a topic that I think I'm going to be interested in um, and just go for it. And if it had not been for the MacArthur Fellowship, that, would, that book would have killed me. You know, we would all be intense on the mall, <laughs> which the kids might like as long as they had their little cameras. But, um, and the book I would like to be remembered for at the moment... 
Ooh, that's hard to say. You know, it might be Angelo, just a 32-page picture book. Um, the book I don't want to be remembered for is a book called Ba, which is about um, sheep that enter an abandoned town, um, and they gradually learn what happened to the people who built the town and who abandoned it. And, um, and it ends, it's an incredibly bleak, desolate book, um, written about 1984. And it must have been reflecting the way I felt. Uh, so Angelo is a, is, is a more hopeful book. It's also set in Rome. It's a way of looking at the city again and at the spaces and at the colors and textures and at the pigeons um, and dealing with life and death. So, but I'm hoping there will be more. Yes. Of what? Did you actually climb on the roof to draw the picture? You mean like for a cathedral or something like that? Or No. I'd actually, because I, I don't speak French, I couldn't get permission to go up there uh, because they wouldn't have had a clue what I was talking about. Um, so I had to, you know, you, you make sketches. You just, you know what it's, how it's built. You can find that out. But it's just a matter, right, it's just a matter of using your imagination to achieve um, an image that, engages by capturing a sense of space or distance or depth. It's, you know, it's really fundamental, basic stuff. And the, the more I do it, the less sketches I have, the fewer sketches I have to make. But I still have to make many sketches to arrive at that point of view, which feels right to me. It has to feel right. It has to feel accurate. It, but it also has to make you feel like you're 100 feet off the, off the ground or... You know, that sort of stuff. It's all part of the thing. But it also has to show you how pieces of timber are pegged together and notched and, and that sort of stuff. So each drawing has a lot of work to do. But if it doesn't engage you to begin with, if it doesn't make you say, whoa, then it doesn't matter. It can be as accurate with all the details as you want. But if you don't care, like life, I mean, walking down streets that don't make you stop and look um, is what we get used to. One of the great things about going to Rome and Paris and London is that you walk down the streets and things are just a little different, so you pay attention. Sometimes you pay attention because there's a sign on the, on the street, like in London, that says, look, whichever way, I've forgotten, but, um, because it's too easy to blithely cross. But you, even that is a detail that stops you for a moment, and you think, okay, got to do this because things are coming. And it's really important to, 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 to look at things, to pay attention to things, to take, to take the time um, to ask questions, to begin to understand, which is why I'm such an encourager of sketching. And I'm not talking about making art. I'm talking about actually taking the time to sketch something, to try to sketch it, because that is going to force you to start asking questions about what you're looking at. Well, what's in that shadow? You can take a picture of it, and you'll get back home, and you'll think, what was in that shadow? But that's it. You didn't take the next picture. Um, the great thing about sketching is you ask those questions as you, as you record or whatever, to whatever ability you have, what, what's in front of you. And it's not, nobody's going to grade the, how well you recorded it, um, but the satisfaction that comes from understanding something that you took a little bit of extra time to look at is enormous, I think. And it's essential because it starts making us ask questions about everything, not just the physical stuff around us, but what people say. One more? One more. Um, so talk about how you, you went to Rome when you were younger and, and you've been a, a few times since then. Um, how do you think your, your, your view or, or your love of Rome would change if you lived there? And if you lived there for 20 years, like 20 years later, would, would you still be seeing... That's a very good question. How would my view of Rome change if I, I mean, I'm obviously passionate about it now because I, I go and I drop in for a while and I'm just, you know, completely refreshed by it. But the question is, would that change if I lived there, if I moved there? And I think it would be different. But, you know, I, I don't think one can live long enough to run out of stimulating experiences wandering through the streets of Rome and or parts of Paris. It's just too, they're too rich because they grew up in their own crazy way. And nobody sort of laid out the grid. I mean, Hausman, you know, did a job. But those are, um, you know, in some ways, those are kind of a wonderful break from, and they've, be, and they've been treated as a sort of grand boulevards. Um, 
rather than as quick ways to get the military to the trouble spot uh, exclusively. Um, they're just rich. And Rome is, I mean, just you could find a little church so tucked away on the outskirts of Rome in the not-so-great part that has something in it that would make you see things a little differently, that would make you admire a craft that you'd never realized could do that, could accomplish that. No, no you know. And could I find that here? If I looked hard enough, um, I'd have to use my car. I think so. I mean, where we live now is in Norwich, Vermont. We have a green. We have a general store that um, is, is a, I mean, it's an amazing general store and that has everything from plumbing parts to sushi. Um, it's, it's only closed two days of the year, Christmas and the 4th of July, at noon. So if you weren't clever enough to get your beer and wine before noon on Christmas or the 4th of July, it's really your fault. But Dan and Witz is open. I mean, they, absolutely everything. But it's one of the... And, and you can walk down the streets of Norwich from our house or you can take the back routes, which is what I do to get to Dan and Witz. And the kids do, and I love seeing this. They don't walk down the main street to get the school bus. They disappear behind some buildings and wander through some woods. And it's, it reminds me of my childhood, which was definitely through the woods, from the house to the school, along the stream, that's where my imagination grew, and I hope that that's where I, that's what hap, what's happening for, for my kids, even though I wasn't bombarded by Facebook and TV and all that sort of stuff, which unfortunately um, my kids are. So I think we'll just leave it right there. We could go on forever, but let's just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.